welcome everyone to uh, another wonderful lecture for uh, Health for the World. And we'd like to, first of all, uh, uh, welcome all of you, uh, many of you around the world and in the chat box and in the uh, Q&A, there'll be an opportunity for you to say hi to one another, but also to put in any questions for our speaker. And this morning, we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Eric Russell, who's a professor of radiology, neurology and neurosurgery at the Department of Radiology uh, at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. I've known Eric for many, many years. He's a superb lecturer and a, uh, you know, an excellent neuroradiologist, former chair of that wonderful department in Chicago. Many of you, I'm sure, who've been to RSNA have walked by uh, Northwestern. It's a spectacular medical center. And uh, Dr. Russell's um, uh, lecture this morning is on, on something very common around the world and very important, and that is imaging for back pain and degenerative disease. So thank you, Dr. Russell, for joining us here in Health for the World. And we really appreciate it. And uh, please um, take off and, and, uh, and, and start your lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, given the opportunity to speak to you uh, from Chicago. It's uh, not quite as uh, sunny as the uh, slide shows. It's a bit overcast and chilly, but you know, it's not snowing, so we're okay here in Chicago. I'm going to talk today about uh, back pain. Let me see if I can advance the slides. I have nothing to declare. Uh, so um, I'm gonna talk primarily about degenerative disease. I may touch upon a few related uh, conditions as- uh, Sandy Fernbach. As time permits, um, but uh, uh, we're gonna concentrate on what is uh, the most common uh, causes of back pain. And back pain not only costs us uh, in our own lives, but it costs society because of the uh, uh, disability and productivity lost uh, that accompanies uh, severe back pain with people who are unable uh, to work and function in society. Uh, and you can see uh, maybe $12 billion a year is spent on this in the United States. Uh, uh, but less than 28% of low back pain cases are severe. Uh, although most of the severe cases account for most of the disability. And one of the uh, uh, topics that we're going to talk about uh, is uh, uh, the fact that we don't need to do imaging for everybody who has back pain. Uh, acute back pain is often self-limited, will resolve after several weeks, and imaging uh, is uh, not necessary. We'll discuss that. Uh, there are mechanical causes and there are non-mechanical causes. Uh, pain can be generated from almost any part of the back, from the disc, uh, from nerve compression, from bone, uh, bony facet uh, changes, and also from the paraspinal musculature, and we'll try to touch on most of this. Also, non-mechanical back pain uh, is mediated uh, by inflammatory cytokines and uh, neurotransmitters. And this is an interesting article from Radiographics in 2020 on the basics of, of the development of back pain and its uh, anatomy from molecules to anatomy. I recommend if you can get to this radiographics paper to do so. Uh, so we mentioned, I mean, uh, imaging is costly. So who should we image? And uh, there's a guy named Jerry Jarvik who uh, practices in the, in the Seattle, Washington area in the United States, who's done a lot of work on, uh, trying to figure out uh, who we should and shouldn't image uh, uh, with back pain. And this is uh, from one of his papers in 2002. Uh, and these are all studies using plain films, myelograms, MRs, CAT scans of subjects who had no back pain, asymptomatic adults. And look at the incidence of herniated discs, bulging discs, degenerated discs, and these people who had had no back pain. That tells you that when you see changes on the imaging study, it doesn't mean that the patient is symptomatic. 
You can't go backwards and say, okay, there's a disc herniation, this patient must be symptomatic. You just can't do that. So this is from Jerry's uh, article in, uh, in the Neuroimaging Clinics in 2003. Uh, and the conclusion is most common cause of work disability, back pain, usually benign. Herniated discs are often not the cause of pain in most patients. And you can see discs and other problems in 20 to 70% of patients who have never had back pain. Uh, the American College of Radiology develops appropriateness criteria for all sorts of clinical conditions. This is the one on back pain, published in the Journal of the American College of Radiology in 2009. And uh, you can see uh, their statement, uncomplicated acute low back pain or even radicular pain is benign, self-limited almost all the time, and imaging is not warranted. And there are guidelines to recognize patients with more complicated problems who would benefit from imaging. And uh, ACR rankings, 10 would be the most appropriate uh, condition to generate the need for imaging. Uh, this uncomplicated acute low back pain is ranked at two, which is almost as low as you can get, unless there are what are called red flags. With red flags, uh, we consider doing imaging up front. And these are some of the conditions that if the patient presents with back pain, you might want to do imaging uh, up front instead of waiting uh, six weeks. Cancer history, fever, immunosuppression, IV drug use, people on steroids, older patients, patients with osteoporosis, and certainly with focal neurologic deficits with progressive or disabling symptoms. Of course, Cauda syndrome would generate the need for an MRI. So um, modalities, we're gonna talk mostly about CT and MR. We may show a few radiographs and maybe I have one myelogram involved, uh, but uh, the modalities most used are CAT scans and MR studies. This is our basic MR protocol. We do sagittal T1, uh, T2 spin echo and T2 uh, weighted stir sequences. The stir sequence is very sensitive to fluid, so edema in the bone, uh, changes in the spine, uh, the spinal cord, the nerve roots are best seen on STIR, short TI inversion recovery. And then we do axial T1 and T2. We don't routinely use contrast. We'll talk a bit about the use of contrast for low back pain as we proceed. And we may use gradient echo studies to look for hemorrhage. We may use diffusion sequences to look for uh, ischemia of the cord, particularly in the conus but those aren't part of our routine protocol. Uh, so bone degeneration, reactive changes may be associated with pain generation. And we can use all modalities to evaluate that. Although bone marrow signal is best seen on MR and in some cases bone detail is best seen on CT. Uh, bony changes, uh, uh, include what are called modic changes. This is a picture of Mike Modic. I'm not sure if he still looks this way. His beard is probably whiter, uh, but he's sort of given credit, even though he wasn't really the first one to talk about marrow signal changes adjacent to degenerated discs. He's given credit to the point where we have a classification that almost everybody uses. So these are modic type one, modic type two, and modic type three. Uh, type one, is felt to be a more active process where you have bone marrow edema to a degenerated disc. So on a T1 MR, you'll see low signal, high signal on T2, and it's a sign that there's marrow edema and vascularity. And at this point, there may be uh, innervation uh, from sensory fibers that uh, may sense what's going on and uh, be pain generators. Uh, type two changes, uh, later on, you have a return of bone, uh, in bone marrow of, of fat, uh, uh, so the T1 signal will go up, and that's a less active process. And then a chronic process, if you have a lot of sclerotic changes in the bone around a disc, you'll see low signal on T1 and T2, so modic type 3. Uh, just an example of modic type 1, and... Uh, you can see uh, at the L45 level, the disc space is narrow. Uh, there's a T1 image on the left, a T2 image on your right. 
And you can see that in addition to the disk space, narrowing the end plates are a bit irregular. And there's lower T1 signal adjacent to the end plates and a little bit of higher T2 signal next to the end plates on the T2 scan. This is motor type one, uh, representing vascularization of the end plate marrow and changes in the uh, marrow itself. And uh, the importance of this uh, pattern, and we'll talk a little bit later about infection as a mimic for degenerative disease. It's at this point where you have marrow edema and low T1 where infection might be a consideration depending on the clinical circumstances. And I remember uh, Bob Quencer, who was chair of radiology at Miami for many years, and I spoke at a conference together. He gave a talk on trying to distinguish degenerative disc disease and lumbar spine from infection. He showed the audience 10 cases, and he felt that uh, a number of them, it was impossible to tell from the initial study whether you were dealing with this type of modic type 1 degenerative change or infection. So stay tuned, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Modic type 1 changes, meaning the marrow and end plate changes, may be associated with pain. This is a study by Thompson of Radiology in 2009, uh, where he did discography. Discography, for those of you who don't know, is a provocative test, where if you're not sure which level the patient's having pain from, you can inject the discs. A normal disc should elicit no pain when you inject contrast into the center of the disc, whereas an abnormal disc may be a pain generator. And uh, if you inject the disc and the patient says, hey, doc, wow, that hurts, and that's my usual pain, then you can be pretty sure that that may be the level that the pain is being generated from in that patient. So they found a high positive predictive value for typical pain when injecting a disc at the affected levels. And the pain generated in that uh, event uh, was felt to be due to nociceptor nerves in the end plates as well as in the annulus and the posterior longitudinal ligament. So the end plate and the disc may generate pain without any nerve root compression. Uh, another possible pain generator is when the disc degenerates, it may uh, fissure. Uh, and you can see these uh, annular fissures. Uh, C is circumferential. Around the edge of the disc, you may have radial and transverse fissures. Uh, uh, these used to be called tears, but that's a pejorative term. When we talk about nomenclature, I'll get more into why we don't call them tears anymore. But type 3 transverse fissures, uh, where you often have fluid at the periphery uh, of the disc that can be recognized on T2MR, uh, may be associated with pain because the annulus is innervated. Just an example, this is an MRT2 sagittal on the left and a cryomicrotome of the spine on the right, uh, taken from a paper by Leo Serviaki, who uh, uh, I actually helped train as a resident here in Chicago at Rush, uh, showing uh, in, in, in the upper lumbar region on the cryomicrotome, you can see the central nucleus and no changes in the white annulus. That's a normal disc. But lower down, you can see the darker nuclear material has extended into fissures in the annulus, uh, anteriorly, posteriorly, et cetera. And on the T2MR, you can see there's relative dark signal in the L4-5 disc. The normal disc on T2 images is brighter, typically, as you see in the upper lumbar region on the MR. There's a herniation at L5-S1. You could ignore that for a bit. But that bright T1, a T2 signal at the back of the disc is fluid in an area of an annular fissure. And this fluid signal may persist for years. And if you give contrast, they will enhance and the enhancement can last for years. So annular fissures, high T2 signal, the enhancement if you do contrast can last indefinitely. So it doesn't mean that the fissure is acute. Uh, and the T2 signal enhancement doesn't really necessarily therefore correspond to an acute problem. But this can be an independent pain generator. Granulation tissue uh, brings nerve endings into the disc. And uh, this high T2 intensity zone, when you do a, a, a provocative test, uh, may uh, generate uh, concordant pain uh, during discography. Uh, just uh, an example of a relatively normal disc and cross section with a nucleus and annulus, and in this case, a herniation of nucleus through the annulus. 
uh, compressing a nerve. Certainly nerve compression can generate pain. We'll talk more about that. But uh, this is an old cartoon from the American Journal of Neuroradiology. I apologize that the uh, uh, cartoon is cut off at the bottom, but uh, the classic conundrum is what we're looking at when we see the disc looking abnormal in cross-section, is it a bulging disc or is there a herniation? <clears throat> on CAT scan, it may be harder to tell than it is on MR and we'll get into that. But here's somebody going to the top of the mountain consulting with the uh, guru saying, geez, what is it with you guys? You're the third one up here, said the guru. This, this week, the same question, is it herniation or bulb? So obviously, Dr. Murtaugh thought this was a pretty universal conundrum. So this is uh, uh, from uh, the uh, American College of the American Society of Neuroradiology, the American Society of Spine Radiology, and the North American Spine Society, which is not a radiological organization, got together and decided we need to clear this up and make some rules. So this is the accepted nomenclature. Uh, so we'll go through it because it's important. So a bulge is defined by a circumferential displacement of disc more than half the disc margin. So that's a bulging disc. Anything more focal uh, is a herniation if there's a contour abnormality. A herniation is a localized displacement of the disc beyond the edges of the vertebral body, the ring apophysis. If it's uh, less than 50% of the disc periphery, zero to 25% would be a focal herniation, 25 to 50% would be broad-based herniation. If it's a herniation, there are various types. If it's contained in the annulus and doesn't come out, uh, it's a contained herniation, or you might call it an intraannular herniation. A protrusion extends beyond the edge of the annulus. And how do you distinguish protrusion from extrusion? It's not based on the size of the herniation. The protrusion is defined as herniation that's broadest at the base of the annulus and tapers more peripherally. An extrusion is if there's disc herniation where a segment of the disc is broader away from the disc annulus than it is where it's contiguous with the annulus. And then if you have an extruded disc, if it migrates, you call it a migrated disc, it may go up, down, or laterally. And if it's detached, this herniated nucleus from the disc margin, it's a sequestration or sequestered disc. So this is accepted nomenclature so that hopefully if people apply this, we're all talking the same language when we look at each other's reports. Uh, one advantage of imaging is the clinician may, if a patient has radiculopathy, uh, not know exactly which root is involved. So for example, here you see a little paramedian disc herniation at L4-5, it's compressing the L5 root, but if that herniation were more lateral, it could compress the L4 root. So imaging uh, often distinguish which level is compressing the root because roots may be compressed at more than one level. Uh, disc herniations are usually paramedian, not midline, because the posterior longitudinal ligament, which is relatively thin at the back of the vertebral body and over the back of the disc, will push the herniation to one side or the other. Although if the disc is apt uh, to do it, it may push the posterior ligament and present in the midline, but that's less common. Most disc herniations are at L4-5, not L5-S1, and they're pretty uncommon above L2-3, but they do occur. In the old days when we did a thin section CAT scans, back when CT was invented, you could only do one cut at a time, believe it or not. We often would not do the whole lumbar region and settle for the lower three lumbar regions because of time constraints, and we would miss occasionally disc herniations higher up. CAT scans are pretty good for disc herniations. A disc is very bright, brighter because it attenuates x-ray better than muscle. It's not as bright as bone, so you can tell the bone from the disc. And the nerve root sleeves have a lot of CSF and the fecal sac has nerve roots, but a lot of CSF, so they're darker. And the epidural fat is very dark. So the fat presents as a good contrast media. And you can see this left posterior lateral disc herniation and it's broadly based, so it's a protrusion, not an extrusion. 
So this is a foraminal disc herniation, a protrusion that's obscuring the root and compressing the root in a patient who presented with left-sided radiculopathy. On the other hand, uh, midline herniations may be a little harder. We do have the normal level on the right, the abnormal level on the left, and you can see how dark the thecal sac is on the normal level on the right. It's not as dark at the abnormal level on the left because there's disc material uh, that's herniated in the midline. So you don't have a clue that the epidural fat is displaced on one side. So on CT, these are tougher to distinguish unless you're looking from one level to the other, and then you can tell what's going on. MR, much easier. This is sagittal T2 and axial T2 MR. And you can see a bright herniated disc, uh, sort of paramedian to the right, uh, severely compressing the fecal sac on the axial scan. One thing about disc herniations, we said that uh, degenerated discs are often darker than normal discs, but uh, herniated fragments may maintain their hydration and they may appear brighter than the parent disc as you can see in this case. Uh, just another example to distinguish on a T2 sagittal MR, normal discs that are bro basically bright at all levels in this patient, except for horizontal darkness, which represents a fibrous cleft in the disc that's also normal, but the bulk of the disc is normal and bright. But the L4, 5, and L5 S1 discs are dark and degenerated uh, dark on T2 because they lose water content. They become desiccated. And if you look again, you can see a little bright signal at the back of each of those desiccated discs. Those are fluid accumulations in areas of annular fissuring. We talked about the annular fissures before. Uh, so here's the question, protrusion or extrusion? Well, it's a very large herniation, but again, even in the axial plane, uh, the disc herniation is broader at the back of the annulus than it is more posteriorly. So this is a large protrusion. Even though you would think, hey, it's extruded through the annulus, that's not the nomenclature. This is termed a protrusion. And in fact, I don't know if I can do this with advance, without advancing the slides. I have trouble at times, but can you see the brighter disc, which is still somewhat hydrated? in the nucleus extending through the annulus. I like to call that the, uh, uh, the track sign or the, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but uh, it's useful to look at that anatomy in the disc when you have more subtle cases of disc herniation. A streaming sign is what I like to call it because the nucleus is streaming toward the area where the annulus is disrupted. Another thing that I find very helpful, apart from the signal changes that we'll discuss, is in the lumbar region on the T1MR, fat is bright and epidural fat tends to be prominent in the lumbosacral junction region, not so much higher up where you don't see much fat behind the vertebra. You see a little bit behind L3, see the bright T1 signal behind the vertebra, that's ventral epidural fat. If you see it, it should be equally thick at the top and bottom of the vertebra. Notice at the L4 level where there's grayness coming down from the L3-4 level, that's an extruded an inferiorly migrated disc. The fat is preserved inferiorly, but you don't see it up on top. So if you don't really see the disc, if you see the fat isn't equally distributed top and bottom, something's wrong and take a closer look. You can see also in this case that the disc is coming through a disruption in the posterior inferior part of the annulus. That's how the nucleus ended up extruded inferiorly. And notice on the stir sequence, the disc fragment is brighter than the parent disc. We did say that hydration may be maintained uh, for a longer time in the extruded disc, so it may have variable signal. Notice also on the axial T1 with the arrows that this disc is migrated into uh, the area called the lateral recess. The lateral recess is the area medial to the pedicle. So if this is the L4 pedicle, this is the L4 lateral recess and the L4 nerve root, which you see here, is severely compressed. This patient had a foot drop because of the L4 root may be associated with motor dysfunction leading to a foot drop. Lateral recess, one place you always need to look on MR. We talked about the streaming sign. 
In this case, it's helpful because you don't really see a big disc herniation. On the left, you see a T2 weighted axial, on the right, a T1. Notice the T1 just shows the disc is uniformly gray. And if you're really paying attention, you might see a little bit of a contour abnormality, a convexity of this part of the disc. And you may see that the fat near this root is a little bit encroached upon relative to the other side. It's a subtle finding. On the T2, you can see though this streaming sign where the disc that's still hydrated, the nucleus, has streamed through the fissure in the annulus all the way to this point where the contour defect is, and this root is compressed. So in subtle cases of contour abnormality, if you didn't pick it up on the T1, look at the T2, look to see if the nucleus is streaming in the area where there is likely a small contour defect. So you might call this an intraannular protrusion. Uh, this is a uh, cryomicrotome on the right of streaming nucleus extending to the posterior midline of the disc. You can see the arrows. There's only a minimal contour abnormality posteriorly. A CAT scan would almost always miss this and call it maybe a bulge. On MR, again, you can see on an axial T2, there's hyperintensity in the area of the annular fissure, and there may or may not be disc in the area of the fissure. Far lateral herniations are important to note in a report. Uh, when they're this far lateral, you can't really operate them through a laminectomy. It requires a far lateral operative approach. You can see this huge disc herniation that's obliterating the fat around the root, which you see normally on the right side. These are more common again at L5, at L4-5, and are more common at L3-4 than they are at L5-S1 probably because of the mobility of the spine higher up. They tend to occur in uh, the 50s, uh, men more than women, and the dorsal root ganglion lives in that area. So that may be associated with exquisite uh, radicular pain. Uh, Schmorl's node. So uh, initially described by a pathologist, uh, Christian Georg Schmorl, a German pathologist in 1927 as the herniation of a nucleus through the cartilaginous and bony end plate into the vertebral body. It's thought maybe axial loading causes these. They're often seen without any acute symptoms because they may not be apparent and come to light when the patient becomes symptomatic from them if they ever do, but they're extremely common on imaging and they're worth commenting upon. Uh, uh, some generate pain, especially you'll recognize it if the patient presents with back pain and you have a Schmorl's node, this end plate depression with an MR marrow edema around it. That might be a clue that it's recent. Symptomatic Schmorl's nodes are probably due to inflammatory response in the marrow adjacent to the injured end plate. Remember, the vertebral bodies are extremely vascular, vertebral veins communicate through a, a dominant central vein at the mid-vertebral level with a Batson's vet, ventral epidural plexus. Uh, and if you inject a vertebral body, you'll fill the veins in the venous plexus. So these are very vascular structures. This is a picture of Christian Schmorl. Sch uh, Sch hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Interesting because uh, he was the director of pathology and anatomy in Dresden, uh, Friedrichstadt, and he died uh, several years after describing Schmorl's nodes, believe it or not, from a pinprick uh, doing a section in his path lab from blood poisoning that obviously they had no antibiotics uh, to treat at the time, a tragedy. But from Resnick's radiology, you can see a central Schmorl's node with nucleus extending into the end plate, just a fairly typical plain radiograph with multiple anterior superior end plate Schmorl's nodes, each associated with a bit of sclerosis around the margin. So this is a conundrum. Here's a CAT scan. You can see the herniated disc on the left compressing the nerve root, and there's a defect in the end plate next to it. So if you didn't know uh, if the patient had an acute problem or a chronic problem, you could say, hey, this is just osteophytic spurring around a chronic disc herniation. But if this patient had an acute injury, this could be an acute peripheral Schmorl's node associated with an acute disc herniation. And on CT, hard to tell. On MR, 
uh, perhaps a demon in the verbal body might distinguish. So sometimes it may be hard to tell uh, in a case like this. Just a diagram from a chiro geek. So chiropractors do, do uh, pain uh, medicine and uh, uh, many of them are very good at helping patients. I don't want to uh, cast any aspersions and they do order imaging studies. You may see imaging studies, but this is from uh, an online publication showing the uh, innervation of the annulus. And you can see that the sinovertebral nerve supplies the posterior disc annulus and the posterior lateral annulus, also the posterior longitudinal ligament. So there's a lot of innervation here uh, that uh, may be associated with pain generation from discs. So discogenic pain. Uh, about 40% of cases are thought to be due to pain generated from the disc, non-radicular pain particularly. Uh, degeneration exposes the nucleus and the ma to macrophages and you get inflammatory changes which excite the uh, nerves which activate the pain pathway. Remember I told you that we don't routinely do contrast imaging for routine lumbar spine degenerative uh, suspects. In this case, we happen to do contrast. So we have an axial T1. Notice the fat is bright as it is on T1 imaging. There's a bit of central spinal stenosis here with a bulging disc, but the bulging disc uh, has a bit of a contour abnormality. It's more prominent convexly posterolaterally on the left, and we don't see fat between that and the root. This patient had a radiculopathy on that side. Contrast will show the enhancement in the annulus. This is an annular fissure with reactive granulation lighting up with contrast. So is the pain related to the root compression or is it related to nerve fibers in the annulus that are inflamed? Maybe hard to distinguish, but contrast can show you this much better than non-contrast MR. We just don't choose to do it because of the expense and the need for a contrast injection. Uh, this is a discogram. I used to do discograms, believe it or not. Uh, they're helpful clinical tests. Uh, the imaging studies aren't very helpful typically, but they may support certain uh, theories about what's wrong with the patient. This patient had left side of radicular pain and uh, localized pain in the back. The axial T1 image shows asymmetric loss of fat posterior laterally. Uh, the contrast image shows enhancement in a broad area in the disc indicating that there's annular disruption and inflammation. Uh, and we did a discogram. So down here, we can see a normal discogram. The contrast is centralized. It's injected into the nucleus. It shouldn't go peripherally. The level above where we see the MR and the CAT scan, that's where uh, we did the contrast injection that elicited uh, the patient's pain. As I was injecting contrast in the disc, the patient said nothing. When I saw under fluoro that the contrast went toward the left, the patient said, ah, that's my typical pain. And we did a post discogram CT showing that the contrast actually extended through the annulus into the area of enhancement on the pre-discogram contrast enhanced MR. So this was all concordant with where the patient's pain was generated and they were confident that that was the pain generated. Uh, this was a case where we happened to do contrast on an unoperated back. Contrast is very helpful in post-op cases in distinguishing scar uh, from recurrent disc herniation. We're not gonna talk a lot about it. We'll talk a little bit, but if you can see this patient has an inferiorly extruded and migrated disc fragment that's maintains its hydration. So on the image, it's white. It's gray on T1. And on contrast, you can see peripheral enhancement. So when we're doing post-contrast uh, scans for post-op, we think, okay, well, the disc won't enhance and the scar will we're, if we're doing post-con MR. And CT, you see the same thing. However, uh, unoperated disc may enhance, particularly peripherally, because if the disc fragments has been sitting there for a while, it develops peripheral vascularization. So this unoperated disc fragment is enhancing peripherally uh, because uh, the body is trying to resorb the disc by 
reducing granulation at, at its margins. And over time, this disc may resorb. And you may see cases occasionally, oh, just a minute, I better not let this reboot. Sorry about that, I'm working in the hospital. So you may see a large disc that disappears over time without surgery. Uh, this is a recent case, a 70 year old man with recurrent radiculopathy. Uh, they thought it was right L3-4, so they operated and did a foraminotomy on the right. He comes back again with similar pain, and now they're not quite sure uh, what level it's coming from. They think it may be L3-4. So this is a post-op study where we did contrast. You see T2 axial left, T1 pre-contrast mid right, and T1 post-contrast top right at L3-4. On the bottom, you see post-contrast T1 images only at L4-5. So we can see at L4, at L3-4 that there's disruption of fat around that right L3 root and around the annulus. And the post-contrast scan shows extensive enhancement around that root. This is post-operative scar. There's no negative defect to suggest that there's a new disc herniation in that area. And we know that if you reoperate on a root that's symptomatic, let's say the right L3 root that's covered in scar, you may not see any advantage, and it may actually worsen the situation. Occasionally, if you're careful, you could try to decompress the root or fuse that level without operating on the scar, and that uh, reduction in motion may help that root recover. But in this case, we have an enhancing annular fissure at an unoperated level, and you can see the edge of the enhancing fissure is right up against the L4 root. So is, is this an L4 radiculopathy in this patient? Is it a recurrent L3 related to scar? These are the situations that can be helped by using contrast. And I'm still not sure which is this pain generator. Normal variants that could occasionally look like uh, disc herniations. Uh, one of them is a conjoint root sleeve because it uh, produces asymmetry of fat at the level where the roots are exiting the fecal sac. The nerve roots are individual and exit their normal levels, but there may be a root sleeve that joins both roots at the exit point from the fecal sac, as you can see here on the right, indicated by the number four. So the roots are exiting their correct levels, but at that level, you'll see more fat around the left-sided root sleeve than the right, because the right side is broader. And if you see asymmetry in fat, it may make you worry about a disc herniation. This is an axial non-contrast CT in a case of a conjoint root sleeve. Notice the arrow is pointing to the root sleeve at the level uh, where uh, you can see uh, the conjoint root sleeve best. On the left, you see fat, lateral to the fecal sac, medial to the pedicle. This is the lateral recess. On the right, very little fat. You do see some fat ventral to that grayness where the fat is missing. If there were an extruded disc and lateral recess, you probably wouldn't see that little thin lay layer of fat because the disc would obliterate it. And as you go down, you can see uh, the asymmetry. And down here, you can see the root sleeve separating. So this is a normal variant, nothing to do. Just don't mistake it for a herniated disc and suggest that somebody treat it. Uh, Another mimic, if you would, would be a prominent venous plexus. I mentioned how vascular the vertebral bodies are. Here uh, you see uh, a soft tissue mass in the ventral epidural space. The fecal sac is relatively small, but it's not compressed. You can see on the MR, this is the same patient. There's a huge basi vertebral venous channel that drains all the veins in the vertebra toward this Batson's plexus. These plexi tend to be a diamond shaped in cross section. You can see that better on the MR. And you can see that there's fat around the margins, even ventrally. A disc herniation this big would obliterate the fat more at the margins than this venous plexus. And remember, the venous plexus is always in between the discs. These basi vertebral channels are right at the mid part of the vertebral body, looking from top to bottom. Sometimes you'll see really weird stuff, like uh, remember these veins in the ventral epidural space may connect to veins outside the spine. 
Here's a huge vein connecting to an extra spinal venous channel coming through the foramen. It's obscuring fat around the root, but it's not pathologic. So if it connects to the veins in the fat sense plexus, it's probably a big vein. Look outside, make sure it connects. It's not something to treat. So be aware of that and look for it. This is not a lumbar study, but it makes a point about uh, distinguishing disc herniations and osteophytes from other processes. Pitfall, ventral and dorsal compression is not always disc or osteophyte. I'll give you a, a minute to think about what this could be. Multi-level stenosis throughout the thoracic region, but notice that this could be disc and osteophyte, but this dark signal goes all the way across to the back of the vertebral body and it's much too thick. Look at the back of this vertebra. Also, there are dorsal areas of dense low T2 signal compressing the cord from behind. This is a simple diagnosis on CT, but as you can see, the CAT scan shows extensive ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament and extensive multi level areas of ossification of the ligamentum flava compressing the cord. So it's important to distinguish disc osteophyte complexes in the thoracic region, the cervical region, lumbar region from simple uh, uh, ossification. They may be handled surgically in a, in a quite different way. Uh, so be aware, because it's a little harder to tell on MR that these aren't just disc herniations. Uh, tumors may obliterate fat around nerve roots. I'm not gonna show tumors, except for a couple of cases. Uh, this is uh, obliterating fat. This, these are uh, post-contrast T1 images uh, showing an enhancing mass in the right lateral recess at S1, obscuring the S1 root. But notice that the uh, uh, bone around it is remodeled and uh, the frame is enlarged. That almost never happens with chronic disc herniations. It may, if the disc is vascularized, it may cause bone resorption, but very rare. So if you see bone remodeling, uh, particularly if you have an enhancing lesion, that's a tumor, this was a schwannoma. Uh, this turned out to be a lymphoma, uh, sort of obscuring uh, the rooted uh, S1 on the right in the lateral recess, but uh, given the uh, enhancement of the Caudic minor roots that you see on the post contrast T1 sagittal on the right and the mass in the fecal sac, you'll never mistake that for tumor. But if you didn't have for this condition, but if you didn't have all that other information, it could be a differential consideration. Uh, let's talk about spinal stenosis. You need to look at four spots in each axial scan if you can see these anatomic regions at every lumbar level. Central canal, you're not gonna to forget to look at. Subarticular region is something our residents sometimes forget to comment on. That can be an area of stenosis between the facet joint and the disc margin. Foramen, you'll never forget. And lateral recess, you shouldn't forget, it's medial to the pedicle. So all four levels. Once the disc generates, you get annular fissures, the disc becomes more unstable. Uh, it narrows, the disc bulges, it may herniate. The height loss leads to instability that may secondarily produce uh, facet instability and the joints may sublux, leading to synovial thickening uh, and osteophytes from the articular processes and the ligamentum fava buckle because the disc height and the facet sublux and they may protrude medially. And all of this stuff ends up uh, encroaching on the uh, areas that we just discussed. You can see here a normal fecal sac, this triangular pattern uh, is characteristic of spinal stenosis. Uh, the subarticular stenoses relative to the normal level are shown here. Just an example of an axial T2MR and a CT, they both are good at showing stenosis in different ways. Here you can see the ligamentum flava or buckled and thickened encroaching on the sac from behind the bulging disc from in front, you can see T2 fluid in the joint that's widened. That's a joint of fusion uh, indicating degeneration. And on the CT, you can see a little bit better that dark signal in disc representing gas in the disc or a vacuum phenomenon. Uh, the set joint itself is innervated. 
So joint arthropathy may be a pain generator. And since it's at times unilateral, it may mimic ridiculous symptoms that may mimic nerve root compression. And uh, you know, we talked a bit about what happens. If you get a lot of joint instability in the sets, it may allow one vertebra to slip on the other. That's called spondylolisthesis. Uh, if the facet joints being unstable cause the listhesis, it's called intact ring. Broken ring listhesis is related to breaks in the posterior elements, typically a spondylolysis, otherwise called pars defects. And just uh, uh, for those of you who never have seen one, this is a tomogram of the spine. It's an x-ray procedure done where you have a special machine to blur out everything but the area of interest. We did this a lot before CAT scans came about. And you see the normal facet joint. Remember that the joint is bordered by the facets. The facets are the surface of the articular processes. These are articular processes. The superior facet is actually part of the inferior articular process. And this is a normal joint with normal thin cortical margins of the articular processes. Look at what happens with joint degeneration. You lose the space, you get irregularity and marked sclerosis. And here on the axial view, you can also get proliferation of synovium that may form cysts that can buckle the ligament further forward, further narrowing the spinal canal, so-called synovial cyst. This is an example on non-contrast CT and myelography of a synovial cyst. It's loosened in the middle and uh, the density of the ligament uh, peripherally, typical pattern. Notice it's not a disc herniation, it's not uniformly dense and it's broadly based against the ligament. And if you do the bone window, you'll see the facet joint is degenerated. Typical synovial cyst here in MR, you can see bilateral joint effusions and uh, widening of the joints, thickening of ligaments. And here's a cyst, cyst that's dissected through the ligament and is causing root compression in the subarticular zone. On contrast enhanced MR, these cysts are fluid, so they're dark on T1, but they enhance peripherally because the synovium enhances. So typical synovial cysts in this case unilateral with severe facet disease bilaterally. Synovial cysts may bleed. So on a CAT scan, it may be hyperdense. If it bleeds on an MR, you may see T1 shortening on this non-contrast T1 scan. Uh, lateral recess stenosis, again, we discussed, you see root compression in the lateral recess medial foot pedicle. In this case, related to severe facet degenerative changes and articular process osteophytic spurring. A CT showing a posterior lateral broad-based disc protrusion encroaching on the foramen with adjacent osteophyte encroaching on the lateral recess at S1 level. Uh, this is a CT showing extrusion of a hyperdense disc fragmented to a lateral recess on MR, same thing. Uh, this, these patients have foot drops at the L4 level because of L4 root compression. So lateral recess stenosis may be due to disc extrusions, may be due to facet arthropathy and a whole host of things. Interesting, this is sagittal T2 MRs on the left and axial on the right. You can see on the right, there's severe central stenosis, no mystery. On the right, you see a phenomenon that you'll see occasionally where at the level of maximal stenosis here at L2-3, you see these serpiginous filling defects in the fecal sac. In this case, they're all above the stenosis. Uh, I had a case once where a clinician came to me and said, hey, that looks like an AVM. Those must be tortuous vessels. They're not. These are redundant nerve roots. When the roots are stretched at a point of stenosis, they may herniate above or below the point of stenosis, and they may go above and below that level depending on the patient's position. And how can you prove that? That these are roots that may travel up and about. These are redundant and tortuous roots from the cauda 
Here's a CT myelogram that we did Sandra reconstructions are. And you can see with the legs straight, the redundant segments of the corticoid roots are above this stenosis and they're straight below. With the legs raised, all of these redundant root segments uh, appeared below the stenosis. So these are mobile and they may be associated with pain. In fact, let's talk for a bit about the blood nerve barrier. And in this case, you need contrast MR. Blood nerve barrier, sort of like the blood brain barrier. Normal corticoid roots do not enhance. A dorsal root ganglia within the foramen enhance, but not the intrathecal roots. And these may be altered by trauma, compression, ischemia, inflammation, even demyelination. And if the uh, changes result in a loss of the blood nerve barrier, you get enhancement to the root. Case in point, here's another case where you have redundant roots above a severe stenosis at L3-4. And in this case, we did contrast and you see the roots enhancing at the level of the compression. Blood nerve barrier breakdown. So contrast can be helpful if you're not sure which level the roots are most uh, affected by in a case of multi-level stenosis, but it's used selectively. Uh, Dr. Randy Jenkins in the late and mid 90s uh, was popularizing the use of contrast enhancement and routine uh, MR studies for lumbar degeneration. Uh, it never quite caught on for the reasons I mentioned, but here's an article if you want to look at it, AJNR 1993. And here's a case where we just happened to get one nerve root enhanced at a level where it was compressed. And if you have multiple levels that are abnormal, if you see one root compressed as an enhancing structure on a post-contrast MR, that may be the symptomatic root. So it can be a problem solver in that kind of conundrum. We talked about severe facet disease and instability leading to spondylolisthesis. Here's a slip at L4-5. Notice that when the vertebra slips forward on the subjacent vertebra, if you get an axial image through this level and you don't see the vertebra, it may look like the disc is bulging or herniated at that level. Here on an axial CT, it looks like the whole back of the disc is way behind the vertebra. But if you looked at the cut below, it would be in line with the vertebra below. So this is a patient with so-called pseudo herniation where it looks like a herniation, but if you look at all the cuts and do a sagittal recon, it's not a herniation, it's just a slip. And you're looking at the disc uh, behind the vertebra above that's in line with the vertebra below. Just examples of uh, spondylolisthesis. Uh, uh, notice that when one vertebra slips in front of the other one, the foramen gets narrowed more than the central canal. So spondylolisthesis is often associated with nerve root compression and radicular pain related to compression within the intervertebral foramina. Okay, an odd case, L5 radiculopathy in a patient who had back surgery. Which side is the nerve root affected? Uh, for quite a while, I didn't realize that the L5 root travels out of the foramen at 5.1 and goes anterior to the sacrum. So those blue arrows are pointing to the L5 roots that have come out of the foramen and gone down uh, in front of the sacral ala. Notice there's a screw impinging on the left L5 root. This patient had an L5 radiculopathy that was new after surgery due to irritation by that pedicle screw. Even more interesting, 19-year-old woman who presented uh, a year before uh, this scan with right-sided L5 radiculopathy, they never found out why. Her lumbar disc levels are totally normal. Now, a year later, she comes back with left-sided L5 radiculopathy. Again, lumbar disc levels, totally normal. What you do see is dark T1 signal in the sacrum and a lack of fat between that area and the L5 root. The T2 shows some high signal edema. Notice on the right, 
and we looked at the prior study from 2009, the right side had subtle low signal T1 at the time she initially presented and they made no diagnosis, they missed this. Insufficiency fracture in a young woman who's a runner who was malnourished. Now the fat is returned on the right, she's okay on the right, and the left side is a problem. So pay attention to the sacrum, particularly in this clinical scenario in patients with isolated L5 radicular symptoms without disc disease. PARS defects, we're not gonna talk a lot about. You can see PARS defects by looking at the parasagittal images. There's a break in the PARS. This may happen without uh, a slip of the vertebra. In most cases, it's harder to tell. Uh, these may look like facet joints on the axial scan, but remember the facet joint is at the disc level. You don't see the facet joint at the mid-vertebral level. You know you're the mid-vertebral level here because you see the basi-vertebral vein. So these are pars defects, worse on the right than the left. These are not degenerated facets. Easier on CT. Remember, if you see a pars defect on one side, it may not be bilateral. And the opposite side is stress. So you may get stress hypertrophy and sclerosis of the contralateral pars when you have a unilateral pars defect. Both of these can be pain generators. Infection may be hard to diagnose. Uh, what you're looking for are signs of infection that don't look like motor type one changes, particularly fluid collections. And of course, if you're not sure, scan the patient again uh, soon after or do a sample of the disc with a needle. This patient is pre-op, shows a disc herniation on the left, in the S1 lateral recess, they took it out. Uh, this is 4-7. Three months later, patient presents with back pain. And we have no intermediate imaging. Now we have a narrow disc and some modic type one type signal in the end plates, low T1, high T2. So it's this delayed post-operative change, uh, degenerative changes that have occurred over time. Or is this an early infection? Patient had no systemic signs of infection. I decided not to sample it, thinking maybe it's degenerative. So this is 7-7. Three weeks later, we did a close follow-up scan now with contrast. And you can see not only have the T1 and T2 changes progressed, but now we see an abscess in front of the vertebra and an abscess in phlegmon behind. So close follow-up, if you're not sure, is important. Or if you don't want to wait, you can sample the disc and look for organisms. Uh, finally, we'll do a few pearls after this uh, point and then quit. Five minutes, please. Just give me a few more minutes. Uh, these are uh, cross-sectional images of the posterior spinal musculature. We don't often think about the muscles alone generating pain, but they do. So why don't we always look at them? Interesting question. Maybe we don't know the names and we don't want to call them what they are. But here are the names. Uh, superficial layer, uh, the erectus spiny formed by the longissimus and the uh, iliocostal muscles and the uh, quadratus. Uh, paramedian near the spinous process. And uh, just lateral to it, we have uh, uh, multifidus and uh, rotator lumborum. Uh, here you see the multifidus and the rotator. These are normal. T1 image, they're all gray, look nice and normal. Interesting paper, skeletal radiology, 2008. Disorders of the paravertebral lumbar muscles. Pathology uh, to cross-sectional imaging, very important paper if you're not into looking at the muscles. 2008, volume 37. Uh, trauma, patient had an extensive muscle strain, didn't have a vertebral fracture, had bad back pain, had an, a hyperextension injury that led to flexion, extensive enhancement on this contrast T1 image threat all of the posterior spinal musculature. This is uh, an illustration from that paper I referenced. And another illustration, Patient who had denervation atrophy of the multifidus uh, 
This can happen postoperatively if nerves are injured and may be a source of postoperative pain, or it can happen with, uh, because of nerve compression. Here you see the muscle is atrophic on this side and is enhancing. So pay attention to the muscles. Okay, three pearls before I quit. Don't forget to look. First, don't forget to look. If nothing is working out on your MR, you might be missing a bony lesion because unless it's obvious, you may not see it. This is a case of an osteoid osteoma, the articular process that wasn't seen on MR. A CAT scan was done because of a bone scan that showed a hot spot there in a young patient. So if the pattern doesn't fit a negative MR, do a bone scan, do a CAT scan, go a little further. Pearl number two, sacroiliac articulations may uh, uh, not be degenerative, but may produce pain if they're abnormal. This is a case of a seronegative spondyloarthropathy. There are many of them. In this case, it was psoriasis. Uh, so look at the sacrum, look at the SI joints on every lumbar study. You may pick up things that aren't strictly disc disease or set disease, things that you're sort of always looking for. And finally, well, next to last, I had four pearls, sorry. Don't forget the conus. Back in the old days of CT, we never saw the conus. Conus lesions often present with leg weakness, but they may not. The conus lesion, as you see here, T2I signal and enhancement may present with pain first. So always look at the conus and comment on it. So you don't forget to look at it, always comment on it in your report. And finally, don't forget the aorta. I've seen a number of legal cases where radiologists got sued looking at a routine lumbar MR for missing aortic aneurysm, aortic dissection. And we're sort of trained not to really look that hard because we try to put a SAT band over things that pulsate so our lumbar images look better. So we may actually hide the aorta with our SAT band if it's too close to the spine, but sometimes it's not hidden. And in this case, it wasn't. And here's a paper from uh, MRI Journal 2010, Incidental Aneurysms on Lumbosacral MR. So look at the order if you uh, can. So hopefully uh, that was helpful. Uh, final message, do your best, not only to describe the findings, but find out from the EMR, if you have access to the medical record, what the patient's specific pain pattern is and try to answer that uh, in your report. What do you see from multiple degenerative changes might actually be the patient's pain generator. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, perhaps our moderator can talk about things he's seen in the chat. If there are questions, I'll stick around as long as you'd like to try to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Russell. That was a superb uh, review of the issues of back pain. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a complex uh, story. Um, and maybe I'll start before the uh, Q&A and just ask Eric um, whether you see a role for any of the sort of nuclear medicine or PET studies that might uh, play a role in determining the source of a patient's back pain. One of the problems that I have in this area is kind of knowing where to inject, particularly in a patient with multi-level disease uh, and back pain or neck pain. Yes, yeah, so I didn't touch on it because of the uh, length of the talk, and it's not something I do clinically, although no. occasionally, and we're not using that routinely here, uh, yet, although there's uh, quite a bit of literature on applying uh, nuclear medicine studies and PET studies to these types of issues, looking at bone marrow uh, uptake of tracer. So certainly I'm not going to get into the details of what to look for and what to do, but yes, I would suggest that everybody try to review the literature and see if it fits into their practice pattern. Uh, FDG PET uh, and other tracers may be useful. Yes, I think I've found that on occasion in patients who have had, uh, uh, who are recalcitrant to, for instance, facet blocks or medial branch blocks, and 
um, find, in fact, the facets are not the problem, but the disc is the problem. So an epidural might be, might be more appropriate in those patients. But uh, it's a very interesting area, I think, in, in uh, trying to sort out some of the physiology here. Um, are there any other questions um, in, the, in the chat that uh, uh, Abhinav, you want to? We do have one question in the Q&A box. I don't see any in the chat. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, we have a question. There's an attend anonymous attendee who's asking, do we use the root sleeve terminology? Uh, well, uh, that's the way I was trained. Is there a new version of uh, describing the, the uh, sleeve of uh, uh, dura and arachnoid that's around the root? I'm not aware if there is. Yeah, I'm not either. I'm not quite sure what um, that's referring to. Um, yeah, the terminology I think is quite um, a tough one, and I and I would I, I agree with you, Eric. I think we ought to have a terminology that is um, somewhat standard out there, in particular since there's a lot of medical legal um, aspects to this. Um, one question I have uh, on occasion along those lines is that someone will slip and fall or be hit or what have you, and have degenerative disc disease and try to claim that 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 mm -hmm. is actually the source of the patient's pain. Yep. And I just wonder if you yep. have um, any experience in trying to determine um, that issue. I mean, is there a time, can one time, as they say some of these findings, time uh, the... Yeah, it's so dependent on the exact circumstance, exactly what the force of injury was and how long it's been since the injury uh, before you do studies. Um, and obviously, if you have a, a fracture that's acute, the MR study may show edema, and that may be a, an excellent clue. Same thing with uh, other fractures around posterior elements. I uh, actually had a, a, an odd case recently that was a medical legal case of uh, uh, a patient who uh, was uh, hit by a light weight and had uh, years of uh, a chiropractic treatment for neck and spine problems and was claiming that uh, part of the symptoms related to the trauma. And part of what they saw on uh, a CAT scan was uh, a cleft in one of the articular processes in the cervical spine. And that was misinterpreted as a recent fracture. And that partially justified the lawsuit and actually surgery when in fact uh, the defect was well corticated and obviously not acute. So one example of trying to piece together uh, these issues related to medical legal uh, cases, but it's a, you know, it's a, every case is different. Yes. Well, uh, thank you again, um, uh, Dr. Eric Russell uh, of Chicago for um, a superb lecture um, and for those of you who are online and interested in a certificate, there is an email that will come uh, with a link to gain a certificate. So um, if, if that's of interest to you, um, watch for that. Um, and again, thank you so much again, Eric, for uh, your volunteering to spend time with this community um, today. And uh, Abhinav, thank you as well. Thank you. Yeah, this, this was a distinct pleasure and an honor uh, to be able to have a broad audience. And I wish all of you out there uh, well, uh, safe, uh, and healthy uh, lives. And maybe we'll do this again sometime. Very good. Thank we you. just had one more. I'm sorry. We just had one more question. Oh, we have three more questions that showed up. Oh, okay. uh, Dr. Moses asks if uh, the cyst that you talked about, is it the same as Starlove cyst? Uh, no, we're, we were talking about uh, see, Tarlov cysts develop from the root sleeve, uh, and uh, these synovial cysts develop due to degeneration of the facet joints. The synovium covering the joint, not the nerve root, gets thickened and collects fluid and may bulge into the uh, areas where it may impinge on the neural structures. So these are not the same. And um, there's another question that they're asking if it is routine for an initial x-ray study before an MRI is ordered. 
We do a lot of spine radiographs. I didn't concentrate on those because I wanted to get into the cross-sectional imaging. Um, we don't do a lot of it uh, for initial workup of uh, back pain, I think, uh, from what I've seen, because I do read plain radiographs of the spine. Uh, relative to uh, the number of cases we see from the orthopedists, uh, pre and post-op spinal fusions. Uh, but yes, I mean, plain radiographs are uh, very important. Uh, and in fact, um, I didn't include it uh, in the talk, but one of the limitations of cross-sectional imaging is it, it's really not possible to do good dynamic imaging. Uh, there are upright MR scanners and wide bore scanners. We do a little bit of flexion extension in the bore of the scanner. Uh, but uh, if you do a myelogram, um, the patient, you can have upright and bend and extend all you like and do lateral views and look at the degree of subluxation. And remember, when we do cross-sectional imaging, the patient is made comfortable in the scanner. We often put their uh, legs up and their knees bent so they're comfortable and not in pain so they don't move during the scan. And we're minimizing the degree of stenosis. Uh, when they're upright, uh, whatever you see in, uh, on MR and CT may get worse, which is why even minor changes are worth reporting on our cross-sectional imaging studies. So uh, if we routinely did weight-bearing CT and MR, we'd uh, probably have more of what the reality was for the patient. That's, uh, I think, an excellent point. Uh... Uh, and, in, and indeed, we've even had flexion extension MRs or flexion extension CTs on occasion demonstrating uh, rather dramatic dynamic changes with ligamentum flava buckling and disc protrusions that occur in one position or another. Right, and we're nice. getting back to the plain film issue, one thing that we do see a lot on plain films are flexion extension views. Uh, right. In the cervical spine and the lumbosacral spine, specifically looking for that even if the patient's already had a cross-sectional imaging study, even if you've called the subluxation of spinal thesis, the degree of the thesis may change significantly between flexion and extension. Okay, with that, I think we'll say goodbye and thank uh, everyone for their participation. Dr. Eric Russell from Chicago, our moderator, Dr. Patel, thank you so much. Um, and um, I, I wish everyone a, a, a very... Happy and healthy uh, New Year. Thank you. Thank you.